And now, would you please enthusiastically help me welcome our first speaker, Steve. Greetings, everyone. I think it just got like 10 degrees hotter since we're walking up those two steps. Uh, I'm Steve. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Steve. And I, it took me a long time to say that. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to say that. Uh, only reason being is because deep in my heart, I knew I had a problem drinking. Uh, I knew I was an alcoholic. But I don't think I've ever met someone or I wasn't proud of being an alcoholic only because I don't think anybody ever said, you know, that guy, Steve McCaskey, that fine gentleman alcoholic, you know. So that was really tough for me for a long time. But uh, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. My story is not that exciting, but it's uh, to me, it's my story. Um, I grew up on Long Island. Uh, I'm one of 15 children, same mom and dad. They're still alive, thank God. Just got back from New York to see them. So I'm blessed that way. Um, yeah, growing up, uh, my first memory, uh, I'm the middle child, so they call that the lost child. But my father had nicknames for all of us, and uh, my nickname happened to be Stupid Steve. And uh, it laughed, but, it, you know, like, you know, they say names. That hurt, you know what I mean? This is my father. He was my provider. He was my protector. You know, why wouldn't I believe this guy, you know? As a four-year-old, remembering that, you know, my father's 75 now, and he's still 6'3". So you can imagine how big he was when I was looking up to him that, you know, why would this guy lie to me? So, and, I, you know, it affected my, I think, every aspect of my life, whether it would be school, so I would never raise my hand and ask a question because it would just solidify my stupidity, you know. And, uh, you know, I remember I was called out in, like, third grade by Mrs. Falk, I was looking at the clock, to, you know, because I kind of knew where the hands were supposed to be for lunch. And uh, she called me. She's like, Steve, what time is it? And I couldn't tell her, you know. And uh, even like that, her calling me out in front of all my classmates was not a good feeling. And uh, she kept me in at lunchtime, and she taught me how to tell time like within five minutes, you know. And uh, I always remember that story because although I didn't believe I thought that I – was a smart person. Um, you know, I wear this watch because I taught my kids how to tell time on a, because they don't teach the kids how to tell time on a regular watch anymore. But that's why I always keep that watch and it reminds me of that I'm not a dumb person, that I can learn anything, you know. Um, but anyway, like I said, going through school, I would never raise my hand. I could never, I would never study because it just, I, I just didn't learn that way. And, uh, always cheating, always lying. I would, try, I, would, I would always do things to make myself feel better about myself or make myself look better, whether it be stealing a pack of gum from the supermarket, stealing a toy out of Toys R Us or something like that, just to make me feel better and look better in front of my friends on the block or whatever, stuff like that. But um, I managed to get through, uh, by the way, I'm a Catholic school boy my whole life, so when the God thing came into play, it didn't help me. Um, yeah, I managed to get through grade school, and when I went into middle school, I was able to work. And uh, I got a job in a restaurant, and uh, that was where I had my first drink. And it wasn't that feeling of that I arrived, or I was a vodka drinker since I was 13. Uh, beer was never my thing. I, I went for the hard stuff right away. I'm a blackout drinker, and that's what happened to me you know, the first time I drank. And uh, I remember waking up the next morning Hungover, of course, first time, uh, but I couldn't wait to do it again. Only re reason being is because I didn't have to feel the self-hatred that I had inside of myself my whole life. You know, everything that I'd done wrong, the lying, the cheating, all that stuff, every time I told a lie, it would compound the, the hatred that I had for myself. And I, I lived with that self-hatred up until just very recently, you know, uh, you know, drinking was, I mean, I was bringing, uh, I figured out how to way to steal vodka from my job. You know, it was a catering hall, so 
at 13, I thought this was pretty clever because I would take a whole bunch of bottles on Thursday night while I was prepping, and then I would bring them back the next Thursday and put them in someone else's party, you know, because it was an open bar. So they were paying for it, so my, the inventory was never off, you know. So, you know, I, I was bringing vodka to school at 16, cutting, you know, meeting everybody at the handball court and stuff like that. I, I'm amazed that I even got through high school, you know. I had a couple of experiences in high school that didn't, with girls, uh, I pretty much dated girls that liked me first and, you know, I could really care less. It was just somebody that, you know, liked me, you know, because I didn't even like myself. Um, one girl I didn't really fall for, uh, eventually she cheated on me with my best friend. So that was, trust issues went out the window right there. Um, ever since, since then, I've, all, you know, I have no more best friends. Uh, girls were out. I've been a loner pretty much my whole life. You know, I, even still to this day, you know, my mother knows that I'm okay. You know, I just went and saw her, but uh, sometimes she'll ask me what I'm doing. I'm like, you know, mom, I just do my own thing. I'm comfortable being by myself now, you know. For a long time, I was, I would always make up excuses or get drunk and they wouldn't even want me around. And then that, that's what I thought I wanted. But then what happened was I was left with the only person that I hated the fucking most, and that was me, you know? And I would drink and drink, just drink to pass out, to come to, to drink to pass out. And this was a very, it was a vicious cycle for years. I've been first introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 25. And I'll, be ha I'll have seven months on the 2nd of September, you know? I've had some sobriety in between, but I wouldn't even call it sobriety. It was just really dry. Uh, jails and prisons are part of my story, all due to drinking. But to be honest with you, that was the place I felt the safest. It was in jail and in prison. You know, uh, I could be whoever I wanted. I didn't have to worry about. If anybody knows Long Island, I know I'm a guy that likes to take off on my mountain bike, and I got a bottle in my backpack. And like I said, I'm a blackout drink. And some of the roads that I crossed, how I got home and how I'm alive today, I have no idea. You know, it's amazing. You know, um, well, anyway, when I first started to get, after I came home from prison, I realized that uh, New York State was not playing with me anymore, <laughs> to say the least. You know, it took two and a half years to sit in there. And uh, I came out and tried to give this an honest effort. And uh, today's meeting at uh, the Nuna. It was about, you know, how honest openness and willingness. And my, you know, I, I didn't want to be honest with anybody, only because if you found out what I thought was honest about myself, you would hate me just as much as I hated myself, you know? And uh, so even to tell you how I felt about myself, you would probably agree with me, because I thought everybody else thought the same way, you know? So there's no way I was getting honest with anybody, you know? Um, been through a couple of sponsors. I tried that. I left things out. And blah blah blah. I met somebody in 2013 in New York in a rehab, and I uh, they sent him out to Prescott. And uh, for some reason, I don't know how many, I've been in numerous rehabs, you know. And uh, I've never ever ever kept in contact with any not one person except this one guy. And I always I look back at it today. It's like God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. You know, he introduced me to this guy, and we weren't the best of friends, but we just, you know, we always, every once in a while, maybe every three months, every six months, we'd make a phone call and see how each other was doing. He relapsed a couple of times, of course, I went out. And uh, I eventually did get uh, sober, and uh, I just think there's just some things in life that nothing prepares you for. And uh, <clears throat> when my nephew passed away, like, can't even, can't even put into words what it did to me. And uh, I stayed sober through his, you know, the funeral and the wig and all that bullshit. But uh, eventually, it happened prior for me from moving to Manhattan back to Long Island. When I moved back to Long Island, I didn't have a program. You know, I didn't like people on Long Island. <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had no program to fall back on. Nobody knew me, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually I picked up over it. 
I like to say it was over, but even that's an excuse. It was just the perfect excuse, you know, and uh, it was kind of right before COVID hit, and uh, I have a job in a hospital in Long Island, and that was tough. Uh, bodies were piling up in trucks and all this, and I was sitting in a hotel room, couldn't go home, my father's got lupus, and where I was living, the woman had COPD, so it was a mess, and uh, I spent about a month and a half, two months in a hotel room, just drinking my ass off, Ubering it back and forth to work, and my sister came and knocked on the door, and blah, 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 she, they knew where I was staying, but uh, normally they wouldn't, but um, yeah, they made a phone call to a friend here in Prescott, and this is how I ended up here. I, they got me drunk. <laughs> They're like, we're going to go to the airport. We're going to go to Prescott and you can go to rehab. And I went to so many rehabs just to, keep, you know, make them happy. When I go to rehab, I do very well. And I think it's because I'm around the people that are just like me, just like here. But anyway, um, yeah, I came here. And again, I'm going to give this my honest effort. And uh, I got here. I went to a hillside and uh, probably the best place I've ever been, believe it or not. They put a lot of things in perspective to me. And uh, my first meeting, I came here to the Nooner, and uh, I met a guy. He was driving a, his wife's Mustang. And uh, I love Mustangs. So we just started talking. And my friend was painting a 68 Shelby. He was driving the anniversary edition, so I asked him. And uh, I did. He took me for a ride. We did my fourth and fifth. So I did. I worked on it for like two weeks. I give it to him. He gives it back to me. He goes, now tell me what's not on it. I was like, you be this fucking guy? You know? But uh, yeah, that's what happened. And uh, I did. He told me a similar situation story that was just like mine. And uh, ever since that day, it was like, I don't know what happened. I'm even getting chills underneath this coat. But uh, something happened, man. And I'm okay. You know, for the first time in my life, I feel okay, and I like myself, you know. I'm not all the way there loving myself, but, you know, that's one of the things, like, I don't put myself out there too much. I'm tired of getting hurt by the people that I love and all that kind of stuff, people leaving, dying on me and shit. So, you know, those are the issues, but I got nothing but luxury problems today, and it's been a, such a short time since I got out. Even met this guy that's sitting in the room tonight, I'm not even going to mention his name, but we used to do crossword puzzles in a rehab that we were in. And he was, and I told him a lot of shit about how I felt about myself. And this guy doesn't know me from nothing, you know. And uh, he used to tell me, he's like, why do you think, you know, this just the things he used to say to me while we were doing crossword puzzles, because you wouldn't think that I'm a nerd like that, but I am intellectually nerd. But, uh, yeah, we had a good time. And just I started to believe it, you know. My meditation consists of, just positive affirmations about myself. And that's another reason why I hate saying that I'm an alcoholic, you know? Although I know I am, and uh, I'm starting to be grateful that I am because the things that I've been through, I'm not gonna say I went through, I put myself through, you know, I survived them. This is cake, <laughs> you know? But uh, I am truly blessed and grateful to be a part of this, this meeting in, at the noon. At the, on the East Coast, I traveled up and down the East Coast running most likely, but my favorite, one of the things that I always stop at in every state are lighthouses. And uh, I came in here the first time, I was like, holy shit. I said, I've been fucking Arizona, there's no lighthouses in this place, you know? <laughs> but I did, I found my safe harbor, you know what I mean? And when I came back from New York, I brought that back. So, safe harbor will always have a piece of New York with them, you know? But, uh, that's all the time I'm allowed, so thank you for letting me speak. And Great talk, sir. <clears throat> and isn't he good looking, nicely dressed? Okay, please enthusiastically help me welcome our next speaker, Kathy. I'm Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic. And I wore my high heel boots tonight for two reasons. One, so I don't trip on my skirt, and two, so I could see over the podium. And um, Steve, I've got to say, I so relate to you. Um, I relate to your feelings, and I relate to your life. 
uh, I was the oldest of 17 kids, and uh, it wasn't pretty. It was very uh, bizarre upbringing, and um, I relate to you coming into the program early. I was 26 years old when I crashed and burned, and I relate sadly to the fact that you didn't stick around. You know, um, my story used to be short, <laughs> but <laughs> if you keep going out there, it just gets longer and longer and longer, and um, I, I won't bore you with all that. Um, I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about something I don't hear talked about a lot in meetings, not sex, um, about um, dual diagnosis, and uh, I was diagnosed bipolar when I was 20, and it's not why I drink. It has nothing to do with drinking, but um, first time I went to the doctor, I was 20 years old, and I was in the black spot. I liked the mania, liked the high. I didn't like the black time. And I went to my doctor, finally I'd been real suicidal, and I thought, I, I just, the night before I'd had out the razors, and I thought, I, I gotta get some help, you know? So I went on my way, and I turned left right in front of a car on my way there, and um, I got to his office, and he asked me what was the matter, and so I told him. I'm like, well, there's two of me, and one of them's trying to kill me. And that was my reality, you know? And he opens the office door and yells down the hallway, could we please get a nurse in here? I mean, what a chicken. And um, <laughs> he put me on Thorazine. He told me, go get this, go home and take it, and see me at the, at, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'm like, fine. So I took it, and it was horrible, and um, I came back the next morning at 8 o'clock, and I said, I don't need this shit, I don't like this stuff, um, I, you know, there's no reason I should be taking this, and it's terrible. And he goes, if you didn't need it, you'd still be sleeping. I'm like, oh. And so anyway, um, I was already drinking, and I, uh, it was my coping mechanism. So I decided that um, I would just ditch the prescriptions and use alcohol. And you know what? That, that kind of worked for me. And I remember, you know, in the big book, in the vision for you, it talks about um, how the more or less people tolerate us, the more we withdraw from society and from life. And at 16, I got pregnant and shuffled off to a home for unwed mothers in Tucson and uh, with the expectation, we already had 14 kids at home, that I would um, surrender the baby for adoption. And I went along with that and I was never okay with that. And I went back to high school and I was an outcast. I was totally ostracized. People that had been my friends weren't my friends anymore. And so I became a total loner. And then about 18, get this one, I married the father of the baby who I don't even like, you know? But my parents tell me that um, I'm damaged good and that's the only person that'll have me and I go, oh. And um, anyway, Turned 18 and I found alcohol and I went, oh, now I get it. This is how I fit in. This is how this is going to work. I can relate to people. I can be funny. I can be tall. I can be anything I want. And I just thought, you know, wow, this is heaven. And so um, that began my love affair with alcohol and um by 26, I totally crashed and burned. I hadn't drawn a sober breath in three years. And um, I'll tell you what got me there. You know, they say you can't get sober for anybody else, but it wasn't the fact that my husband was going to throw my butt out on the street. It was my kids. And um, I had just suffered an 18-hour blackout. I had painted 
a house, the brown trim on our two-story yellow house, my parents, not my house, in an 18-hour blackout. And um, I also had a, what they call collapse of the um, alibi uh, system. Everything I had been drinking over or telling everybody I was drinking over had been remedied. And I'm still drunk on my butt. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. So I, I didn't drink for four days. Now, that was a miracle. But at the fourth day, I was completely coming apart. And um, my, I was trying to get my kids ready for school. And I said, and the little one, who was only six, spilled his milk. And I said, dang it, get in the car. And he looks at his older brother, and he said, come on, Sean, we got to go get some beer. He was six years old, and he knew what was wrong with me, you know? So I didn't, I didn't put him in the car. I called AA. I was still um, going to do it myself. They wanted to send but somebody over. I'm like, tell me where there's a meeting. I'll go myself. And so I did, and I stayed sober for 15 years. What I didn't do, which was my pattern, is I was on and off medication the whole time. I hated the medicine. And um, I wouldn't stay on it, and um, I wouldn't take care of myself. And so anyway, 15 years later, um, there's not, not the reason I drank. I drank because I'm an alcoholic. But um, my brother committed suicide. My mother died six weeks later, and then I had a granddaughter born with real serious birth defects. And how I dealt with that is I drank. And then I stayed sober for 10 years because I can't drink. I'm just like a sniveling, puking, falling down drunk. It's not pretty. And um, I always get in trouble. And so anyway, uh, I stayed sober for 10 years this time. And then I went out. And then um, I stayed sober for six years. And I, I had a reason why I didn't stay on the medication. A lot of it makes me fat. And so, um, you know, it never bothered me. It never stopped me from eating ice cream. But I wasn't taking that medicine. So uh, anyway, then I stayed sober four years. All the consequences are building up. I go to, I crash my car. I drive through a corral in a block wall and almost into somebody's swimming pool, total the car, get out of the car and um, fell down because I was drunk and um, it was muddy. And then the cops came and then I got arrested and then I went to Tenth City for 45 days. And um, you'd think that would stop a certain person from drinking, but it didn't. And so then I stayed sober two and a half years, and then um, I stayed sober a year and a half. And today, I have one year, three months, and five days. And, uh, and you know, um, I was widowed seven years ago, and I never, um, you know, thought about a relationship or anything, but um, the last time I drank, I, I had this really, wonderful roommate. I'd never had a roommate. I had husbands, but I didn't have roommates. And uh, she was a wonderful cook. She was kind. She was understanding. She was neat and tidy. I mean, perfect, you know. But um, she kept calling the cops on me. And, um, <laughs> and I really liked this woman a whole lot, you know. And the last time... Um, I ended up going to a mental hospital for 11 days, and my friend left. My friend left because I hurt people, and I especially hurt people I love. And um, when I got out of there, and I uh, started going to meetings, I got a new sponsor, and went to meetings every day, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I learned to um, develop a relationship with God. And I finally figured out it's not about me. It's not about what I do, how many meetings I go to, how many people I sponsor, none of that. It's about God's grace. And um, 
he keeps me sober, and that's just a beautiful thing. So I, I was talking to God about relationships because I was just so damn lonely. But I was thinking a puppy or something, you know? And um, lo and behold, my, I get this call from my 24-year-old grandson, and he's been kicking around, and he figured out he's not going to make any money if he doesn't go to college. So he wants to go to Yellow by college. And he wants to move in with me. And he's kind, he's thoughtful, he's considerate, he's motivated. I'm just like, wow, you know? You never know what God's going to give you. And um, it's just a beautiful thing. And I sponsor, um, I told her things that I was going to take to the grave. I was so afraid I'd be rebuked and rejected. And what she said was, me too. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm very grateful for my sobriety today. I take it very serious. I don't take myself too serious, but I take this program serious. And um, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Kathy. Wonderful talk, both of you guys. All right, now please enthusiastically help me welcome our last speaker, Philip. Hi, my name is Philip. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is September 27th, 2015. Okay. It took me over 41 years to get here. I have had a sobriety, uh, a dry sobriety. I, did, I was not willing to admit that I was an alcoholic ever. I went to court. I, 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 talk, I spent the week, a couple weeks with my friend that I met in uh, kindergarten. I've known him 61 years. We went to Hawaii. And he reminds me of all the crazy things that I did. So I'm kind of prepared for this today. But I'm very nervous about speaking for 15 minutes. I can talk your ear off. But <laughs> to stay on topic is very difficult. And to talk about myself is kind of rough, too. But he reminded me that. And my friend Kevin had told me, he says, you go to the barbershop enough times, you'll get a haircut. So I guess I deserve this. I'm honored to be here. But my friend had told me, he says, do you remember the time when this and that happened? You know, and, and there's a lot of crazy stuff that I did in my life. You know, I, I began drinking as a junior, I mean, a sophomore in high school at Polytechnic. Uh, and I just drank. And it, it released some of the, the fears that I had because that's, that's probably the reason why we, I do some of the things that I do is be out of fear or, you know, something is not pleasing me. So I, I started drinking and it just got to be, it was a normal thing. Uh, I had so many different people that I would look at and they had drink, you know, I see today that they had drinking problems, but it seemed normal to me. You know, everybody more or less did it. I got angry. I had a, the first resentment I think I ever had was with Budweiser because I drank with them for so many years and they never gave me a calendar, a speedboat, or any of those things, you know. So I switched to Miller and, you know, <laughs> they gave me nothing either, you know. So then at, at the end there, and I did everything. I, I tried everything under the sun to change this thinker of mine with the exception of heroin because at a young age, probably like four, my mother's side of the family was from Santa Ana and my father's side of the family was from East Los Angeles and his dad drank hard liquor. My great grandfather drank hard liquor. My great grandfather drank so much whiskey that he would wake up every 15 minutes and pull the bottle out and take a hit. And my grandmother finally told her, she says, you wake me up in the middle of the night and you're interrupting my sleep. It's me or that bottle, Joe. And he moved to the garage for 32 years. He was the happiest man that you wanted to ever meet. He, I never heard him crying. I never heard him whining. He could give people stuff. He had a good living. He worked hard. And he was totally happy. And I thought, there's an example of somebody that can do this. And I had other examples like that. So I'm twisted up here, right? My friend Earl, back to this guy, he comes up and he says, Philip, I go, I don't know how many times I've been 
arrested for drunk driving? He says, four. I says, oh. I went to jail in Mariloma for one year. The judge says, I will not see you in here again. I said, just put me back on probation. We'll get this straightened out. I'll give you more money. He says, no, you're going to jail. So we went back and forth for months. I'm dragging my mom in there. I'm drinking my boss in there. He drank a bottle of Scoresby every day and drank beer all day long. And he was nuts. And I thought, well, there's an example. Somebody should be in jail, you know, and it didn't happen. But nevertheless, I, here we are, four, four drunk drivings, one year in jail, and I'm still drinking. Through the grace of God, a friend of mine that got me into uh, a fraternity in, in Long Beach, you know, I was, went to Poly High School, and he's, he goes over to my mom's the day I get out of jail, and he says, I'm going to take Philip, and we're going to move into an apartment. We're going to straighten his life out. And I moved over there, and we ran out doing a lot of cocaine and drinking and, and doing crazy stuff. But eventually he moved out. I was living by myself homeless. I was living in a guy's house, but I didn't pay him rent. But he wouldn't kick me out. And I met up with girls. She took everything I had, and there I am with a cat. I don't like cats, or I didn't at the time, but this one had personality. So I, I stayed with that thing, and inevitably what, what had occurred was I, I was very lonely and desperate. I met my wife, and she had four children. We raised them. I was with her for 30 years. She saved my life. I know she read that book, you know, because she kept telling me what we heard today is this. You can't do it for yourself. I mean, for anyone else, you've got to do it for yourself. And I always remembered that. So, you know, what I'm going to tell you is <laughs> the thing that keeps me here is the fact that it, after 41 years, I came to the conclusion there's absolutely nothing I can do that's going to stop me from drinking. My daughter was born in uh, 1986, uh, March 30th. And she is a combination of my wife and my grandmother, which are the two scariest women I'll ever meet or know. And we lived together. Well, she told me one day, she says, you're an alcoholic. Go to a meeting and don't talk to me for two or three months until you get some chips. And I did. She just hung up the phone. Usually she'd help me with everything. And that scared me. And I went to, I, I went to my first AA meeting at the round table in Long Beach, California. And that was way too rough for me to stand at the podium. And here we are again. Oh, my gosh. Stand at the podium and say, I am an alcoholic. The first time I did that, though, something's magic happened. I felt that I was OK. But that night prior to that, when she told me that, she let go of the phone. And I, I just went and I looked out over the Wil in Wilmington at, at this refinery. And I said, God, help me to, to do this. I went to sleep that night, woke up the next day, and I was over on, in Signal Hill on uh, Cherry and Willow and walked into the Chevron station, parked the car there, ran in, opened the cooler. And I, they have beers that are like this big now. Budweiser again, who'd figure? And there I am, and I'm walking with the cell phone, and, and I just started laughing. I look at this bottle, and I go, I'm talking to my wife, and I go, she goes, what's going on? I says, I'm, I'm at the Chevron station. I got a beer in my hand, and I don't drink anymore. She says, honey, just come home. I knew at that point that I no longer had the desire to drink, but the thing is, I ask myself, and I'll ask everyone in this room, and I know it's not appropriate to do that, but when I did that, I, I asked myself, or I knew, there's no way I can do this on my own. I could not control my life. I couldn't control my drinking, and it was an imaginable step one. From zero to one, I knew that. Okay, so that being said, I, I would ask that we ask ourselves that. Number two is, and this I, I believe each and every day of my life. The people in this room know me. I sit in that chair over there when I come. I come an hour early to have that chair because I have certain principles that I go on in my head, but I was over there today. Okay, so what, I changed my life, and this thing is, am I willing to go to any length to stay sober? Today I am, any length. I did it when I began. It was thrown at me, you know, sitting on the wall. How you doing? What's going on? The deal is, I did then. It took me five years, ladies and gentlemen, to do my steps because I sit here and I talk to you guys in these meetings when I'm asked to talk. And I'll talk about anything, especially me. And there I am. And I'm doing step work, going to 12 step meetings and telling people my life. God's with me all the time, He knows. 
I'm telling you guys, so I'm doing my 12 steps. So what I'm doing is I'm sponsoring myself. Doesn't work. There came a point in time where I said, I, I, I was at the men's stag meeting, and unfortunately my men's stag meeting, it broke up. We have the men's stag meeting in Dewey Humboldt, which I'm, that's my home group, and then we have another one in Prescott. I go to, I attend both those meetings on Thursday. Mike asked me to speak, and I'll be damned if my sponsor said, you're gonna speak. Because I was trying to get a ride out, but I couldn't. So in doing that, I, I'm here today, I have the honor, and I, uh, I go to those meetings, and, and that, when I came, we left here, I've lived, lived in Prescott Valley since 1996, we left here 2014, that occurred 2015 when I had that beer in my hand at that gas station, I got sober there. My wife passed away 2017 of May back here because when we were there, she, her granddaughter says, I'm going to have a child. And they said, well, just let them live in your house. And I go, that's not going to work because they won't, pay their, they won't pay the mortgage payment. I'll lose the house. So she says, well, we're going back. I says, it would devastate you. She says, I'm going back. And we did. And when we did, I was still sober. The first thing I did was I called Intergroup. And I says, what's going on? And they says, who's this? I got to talk to a guy named Happy Jack. And he says, what can I do for you? And I says, I need a meeting today, and I need a men's group. And he says, okay, how many years sober sobriety you have? I says, I got one. And I didn't know nothing, because I sat in the wall, in the wall you know, wallflower that I am, and I just listened. And he says, well, there's a, a meeting today, and he gave me the directions that. He goes, there's two men's stack meetings. There's one at... Uh, on Saturday or yeah, Saturday, Sunday morning here and a lot of newcomers there some people here that have some sobriety and then we have the one that I belong to is Humboldt Dewey and I said well that's close to me I'll go to that one but I went to both and I checked it out I'm still kind of a part of the one on Sunday when I have a chance uh, I've discovered Al-Anon so I'll come to the Al-Anon meeting and then I'll come here but that's a different topic and stuff you know so I'm an active member in my recovery, and the thing that I mentioned earlier, and I don't know if you, any of you guys were paying attention or caught it, was would I go to any length to hold on to this? And that's what I do. I go to meetings all the time. Does that mean I have two minutes left? Two minutes. Yay! Oh. <laughs> so I bel I, I'm an active member. The any length part of this is I've been, you know, I did my steps, I'm doing that stuff, and I got a sponsor, and we talked to him, but I saw that I was losing that pink cloud. I saw that my sobriety and most of all my spirituality. I, I did that thing that they call the psychic change because I came to the conclusion I can't do this on my own. What do I got to do? And, and I came to the thing that my higher power has always been with me, good and bad, and I gotten out of it, so... I was losing that, so I, I, I took an evaluation of my life in, in, I would say, roughly five weeks ago, and I said, what am I doing that's not correct? And it, it took a few days, and I said, I've got to change my program. I attained a new sponsor. I go to one less speaker meeting a week. The other one I get to come here, and that's my chair on Saturday. On Saturday. <laughs> And then, you know, I go to uh, two men's stack meetings and I go to a men's group. And that is so wonderful to hear anywhere from 10 to 15 guys talk about a topic. And, and I put myself in all those places. So they're they're kind of like my sponsors. So that woke up my spirituality again, you know. And, and the other thing is that's very important to me, and I kind of got... I like to give resentments rather than receive them, so I try to keep in this my mind in a, con a God consciousness to do what the nice thing is to do, to speak well about AA in my life, and and to keep those those things going. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is, it, it's a it's a phenomenal change in my life. Things have changed that I wouldn't believe. You know, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, you don't have to go out. You don't have to do this forever. You just have to trust God and, and clean house. The one thing that I was going to mention on the coins, I carry them with me all the time. It says on there, unity, recovery, and service. Okay. 
we're all here together this unity service is something that I do I'm part of that I, I'm a GSR recovery is what we're doing okay but the thing that I like this is a little coin here it's kiss keep it simple sweetheart and that's very dear to me. Uh, all these chips mean something to me. And the thing is, I read each and every one of them when somebody gets a new chip. And it says on there, to thy own self be true. Do that, you know. So I had to do that. I had to evaluate. And that's it. I just do this all the time. And I have, have to remember that I am an alcoholic. And, and what is my wish is, is to, to be happy and to do God's will and to be spiritual and to believe it. And I believe in all of you, and it can be done. Thank you.